intentionality is really actually at the heart of a lot of what we do. We're intentional about the way we program those public markets. We have a we're a very strong mission driven organization and we value small food businesses in particular those starting and trying to build capacity in the city of Detroit. Um, and so we're really intentional with the way we program those public markets to try to give access to small to mid-sized uh, farmers, uh, urban, rural farms. We try to support those operating in both Detroit and the region and the state of Michigan. Uh, but it's also, intentionality is also really woven into our, our neighborhood development plans. Um, we have a lot of pretty ambition plan, ambitious plans um, of really supporting development in and around our neighborhood to retain it as, and this is a true um, statistic or talking point, that Eastern Market is the last operating urban district in, um, in no, urban food district. Yeah, we're the last uh, urban food, remaining urban food district in the United States of America. So what that means is other neighborhoods where they operated as urban food districts, so a concentration of meat packing uses, for instance, or wholesale produce um, uses, for instance, a lot of those neighborhoods have gone to the wayside in lieu of things like mixed um, use development, commercial retail, housing. Um, and so Eastern Market has retained its core use and core operations as an urban food district. So in order for us to retain that use, which also translates to relatively high paying jobs for Detroiters, um, we have to be intentional about our plans for doing that um, in helping existing businesses expand their food uh, footprint, um, keeping them in business, making sure they're not displaced when um, property values inevitably go up, new development like um, the I-375 highway uh, project that's uh, in the works right now is going to impact our neighborhood. So when those things happen, we have to be really intentional about um, sustaining the uses and the, the lifelong family-owned businesses that have been there for years. Thank you. And just a, so a lot of people don't realize, I mean, Easter Market, you might go on a Saturday and you'll get like 50,000 people on an awesome Saturday and over 250 vendors, but its main business, to her point, is the wholesale market. And that's Midnight to 5 a.m., you know, most days of the week throughout the year, right? Wolverine Packing is a great example, right? It was, um, they make 9 million hamburgers a week out of Eastern Market. And most five guys burgers are coming from Eastern Market. And they wanted to expand and they were looking to have to move out of the city to do that. And so that's just one example of getting how they worked with a legacy company to be able to stay in stay in Eastern Market District and make sure that those jobs were still available and accessible to Detroiters. So I know we can, you'll have to come on the Eastern Market to our learning journey, but um, even for things where we think we know, oh, we're from here, or we've been there a million times, or I read about it, if you're not from here, there's always um, more to the story. And I think that's what we're talking about here with intentionality, intentional legacy for Resilient City is actually what it is supposed to say up there. Um, but <laughs> Jermaine, talk about your work and intentionality. Sure. Um, so, so my work, similar to Katie, uh, is, is focused on neighborhood. And I think when we're talking about being intentional, it actually starts with the practitioner, right? Um, I think a lot of times when we are, as practitioners, we go into neighborhoods and some of us are like, well, I'm an expert in transportation or I'm an expert in architecture or uh, expert in design. And so we go in with the mindset of like, I have the solutions, folks come and see me, right? Um, and I think that that's that's the wrong way to go about it when you're talking about a city like the city of Detroit, where neighbors and, and folks have been through so much. There have been a lot of folks who have come through and like, well, let's let's research your neighborhood or let's, you know, let's use your neighborhood as a pilot project or something like that. So there are a lot of memories that residents have of folks coming and making promises to them and not delivering. So for us, the intentionality behind our work begins with planning with community. Um, our partnership is a public private partnership called the Strategic Neighborhood Fund is roughly, uh, we raised roughly $75 million and we've leveraged to date $262 million in investment in the neighborhoods of Detroit. There's 10 neighborhoods specifically yeah. that we've been involved in. And in those communities, we started with the, with the city plan. That planning process took 12 to 18 months. There were hundreds of meetings with residents and I'm, and I'm talking like down to the block club level, talking knocking doors, uh, putting door hangers on to share information with community. So folks felt involved, connected, and understood what the process was from beginning to end. 
Now, that doesn't mean that you're getting 100% agreement with what's happening, but when you give folks the opportunity to, one, to be empowered enough to say, this is what we want, Two, to be able to advocate for it. And three, to say, well, these are the things that we absolutely don't want to see in our neighborhood. That provides you a guideline for now, those of us who have the resources, how do we begin to deploy those resources towards the areas that folks have, have identified? So in some of the communities, we're talking about increasing green space. So we've invested in parks across the city of Detroit. Two, we've talked about uh, infrastructure, street and pedestrian improvement. So in all of the neighborhoods that we're invested in, we focus on improving that infrastructure along with the city of Detroit. The other pieces are affordable housing. Um, in a lot of neighborhoods, when we're talking about being in, intentional about non-displacement, about, um, you know, staving off gentrification, it begins with those residents and understanding where their income is, where the opportunities that exist. We need to start with affordable housing and then transition into those spaces that would allow for those folks who maybe have a home business or want to be an entrepreneur um, to, to have access to tools that will allow them to grow their business. And hopefully um, we can invest in real estate on, along the corridor in their neighborhoods where folks can take their business from their home to the commercial corridor nearest to them and serve their neighborhood. And so being intentional to me is about starting that space, acknowledging where you're from, but also acknowledging the value of the stakeholders uh, on the ground before anything else, um, before providing a solution or providing a tool. Talk to those folks first and make sure that they're engaged throughout the process in an intentional way. Absolutely. And the whole goal being investment without displacement, because you, you, it's not that there nobody wants investment ever, right? For the most part. Um, but how can you have investment without displacement? And there's some great examples with the Strategic Neighborhood Fund, whether that's Livernoy in the Avenue of Fashion, where it's 40% vacancy 10 years ago, and now it's 100% pretty much, but it's still local black businesses or East Warren and making sure that neighborhood people in the neighborhood are having the ability to be the ones opening these new businesses. Um, and shout out to Chase Contrell and Building Community Value. If you're not familiar this is also about sharing tools that we can all use, right? And this is a class that is um, provided for residents, any, you know, anybody who wants to, about how to become a developer. How do I renovate that building? How do I build this project? Um, and making sure there's the tools and funding available for the residents uh, to have that investment so they are make, getting to make the investment and then get the return on investment in the, their own neighborhood. Um, thank you so much. Riska, uh, a little bit different, you know, so we got all this Detroitness, but we get this representative from the Netherlands. Uh, and we were talking just really briefly to set the scene is when we talk about diversity and, um, in Detroit with 90% people of color in the city, it's something that's like always the head of it. And I was really surprised to learn that there's diversity in the Netherlands. And that's on my, it's my fault for not thinking of things, you know, like that. But 25% of people in the Netherlands, um, are not from the Netherlands, which is actually pretty high for a lot, um, some European countries and specifically in the area that you are working with. So what does intentionality look like for you? Hi, everyone. My name is Rinske Brandt from Brandt the Urban Agency, founder. Uh, I'm also a researcher and a journalist. And um, in my daily life, my professional life, I try to connect the dots between top down and bottom up. Um, a lot of areas that we work in are in uh, migrant districts and one of our major projects is in Amsterdam Southeast, also familiar as the Belmer. Um, it has 90,000 inhabitants representing 130 nationalities and even people from a Dutch origin are a minority, so there's no majority in that region. Uh, but most of the uh, real estate is owned by predominantly white companies. Um, one of the real estate owners has a big shopping center, CBRE Investment Management, you might know it, it's a multinational. Um, and um, this shopping center used to be a vital part of the daily lives of the people living in Southeast. It was the place where they would do their shopping, it was a place that we they could meet, uh, it was a place full of local businesses, but over the years the local businesses were replaced by the big chains because, very simple, makes a lot more money to uh, bring in McDonald's and KFC. Um, fortunately, the real estate owner now sees that this model, this uh, blueprint thinking, this one size fits all doesn't work and especially not in this neighborhood. So with the transformation of the whole area, they're going to build 
20,000 more housing. There's like thousands of square meters extra office space, but there's also a transformation of the shopping center. So uh, earlier you mentioned the concept of placekeeping. I really like that, but I think that we're actually doing place restoring. We are giving back the place to the people living in Southeast, bringing in local businesses, creatives, emerging cultural organization, because it's also the epicenter of hip hop and street art, and that should be represented in this heart of Southeast. So intentionality. It all comes down to the right intentions, right? If we would agree upon creating a vibrant place where all people would feel welcome, uh, all our actions will be aligned with that intention, and so would the result be. But if one of us would decide that maximizing revenue would also be an aim, that place would come out completely different. So, yeah. So how do we balance the need for revenue, which Ed is needed to do most projects. Obviously, there's philanthropic dollars, you know, but one of the things when we talk about even affordable housing, right, what does that mean? Helping um, locals understand AMI and all of that, like affordable by the federal definition is a regional number. So for Metro Detroit, it's $75,000, but for the city of Detroit, it's like $35,000. So if something's affordable based on AMI or 80% of AMI, which is very common, it's not going to be affordable for Detroiters. So we're looking at the projects you guys are doing. A lot of them have 50 or 80, uh, 30, 50, so forth, percentage. Now, what, but a developer, so say someone coming through Chase's program and is like a first time developer and was going to take this old building and make it into some residential mixed use. And then the community says, well, why isn't it all affordable? Uh, why can't, you know, isn't it at 30% AMI? Because there's still a cost to develop that building. So what are your thoughts or tips or experiences on how we manage that investment without displacement, which includes making sure they're um, the rev balancing the revenue versus the community impact? Jermaine, you want to start? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with that question. Um, it's a great question because affordability means something different to a lot of folks, Right. And so for, for us, when we start talking about affordability, which is my background, I worked for MISHTA for about 12 years, focused solely on affordable housing and, and had the same role at the city of Detroit, is that when you're talking and having conversations with folks, there are some folks who hear affordability and they think like, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's really low income subsidized housing and I don't want to see that in my, in, in my neighborhood. Or you have folks who are like, well... That, that's affordable, but it's not affordable enough for me, right? And so what you have to do, at least in, in my experience, is have those conversations. You also have to, as practitioners, provide the, the view of what affordability means, not just from the federal, federal perspective, but on the ground perspective. Because as, as Jeanette mentioned, here in Detroit, 80% AMI is, you know, it's like 75,000. We think that folks, the, a lot of folks who need affordable housing here are at that 50 to 60% mark which is about 15 to 20,000 less than that, right? Um, and so the reality is, is that having those conversations, understanding what that data is on a local level is extremely important. The second piece of this is that we, you need to know what tools are out there. And the only tool that is like a consistent tool for affordable housing is a low income housing tax credit. And unfortunately, there's only so much of that to go around. So you have to really be innovative in your approach. And so the city of Detroit, they've cre created an affordable housing fund that can assist with projects. Our fund with the Strategic Neighborhood Fund can also assist in these types of multifamily projects to bring that quality affordable housing. But also, I, I need to say this, a lot of neighborhoods that are asking for affordability are not asking for total 30% total affordability in their neighborhood, because that would be terrible as well. What you need is that income diversity in neighborhoods. And so being able to, one, express that need and that, that desire within the neighborhood that you can hit all of these different income levels with the housing, with, with the housing that you're bringing online is extremely important. So for, for, for those of you who are active in this space, again, affordability is key, but understand the nature of your neighborhood before you say 30% is what this neighborhood needs or 50% is what this neighborhood needs. Really in all, you want that cross-section between affordability from, from 30 all the way to market rate. 
So, Katie, going back to the thank you so much. That I mean, and again, we could have a whole panel or two on um, affordability, day. right? Uh, which is certainly part of uh, the intentionality and sustainability part uh, of a community. Um, do you, when as you guys have been working, and I know you're newer to the role, but certainly in your previous work at the, uh, with the city, um, how has you know Eastern Market and what tools or tips can you provide or thoughts on? Balancing the new with the long-time legacy uh, needs. So, I listening to Jermaine talk, I was reflecting on sort of several different elements of of this. Um, uh, prior to be, so I've been at Easter Market for about seven months. So, I'm relatively new to the job. I'm not really new to the neighborhood or the organization. Um, having worked at the city of Detroit for seven years before that, uh, primarily in the planning and development department got the privilege of working on several of the neighborhood plans that are now being implemented in the strategic neighborhoods, but also the neighborhood plan um, that's not, that we are now implementing in Eastern Market. And I think what, I'm, what I was reflecting on when I was listening to Jermaine talk is that from my unique perspective, I kind of had this experience with working in neighborhoods, thinking about the built environment, thinking about housing development and how you balance the cost of construction versus the um, amount of rent you can get for those units and how there's inevitably going to be a difference between those two, especially if you want to serve the people that we are always trying to serve, both when I was at the city, but also at Eastern Market, where we want to be able to offer a high quality, affordable housing to the people who need it the most. Um, so that, to me, feels like one element of it. But that's where, you know, being at Eastern Market has given me this different perspective around jobs and um, the the provision of jobs that that pay folks uh, an honest living wage that means that they can then afford the quality housing. And I think there it, the, and the Eastern Market is also a unique place where we have the opportunity to offer the jobs, but we get to offer the jobs in a type of industry that is unique to um, some other industries. So, and what I mean by that is it's not necessarily just sort of your run of the mill. Um, college well, college degree, yeah, tech or, um, uh, and I don't mean run of the mill dismissively. I just mean there's this kind of opportunity to market for a unique type of food related job. Some of it's related to op operating your own small food business, which is really a good fit for a lot of folks who want to be an independent business operator. And so I think, so what I'm trying to say is that a lot of this, um, this conversation around affordability, it's, it's more complicated than just the built environment or what we can offer through the built environment, through housing um, and through public infrastructure. But it also involves this element of providing jobs, having those jobs be interesting to people and fulfilling to people and um, not just a means to an end, which is to, to pay for to pay for housing. So it's it's an ongoing process. There's no one fit, one size fits all answer to this question of of affordability and offering and making sure that neighborhoods, especially in a place like Detroit, are affordable and accessible to people. But um, those are just some of the things that I think about as kind of adding up to a successful outcome or at least a, the elements of a plan that can result in, in something that feels more equitable, more accessible, um, and providing more opportunity to more folks. That's a great point. The job, diversity of jobs and getting higher paid. Uh, the example that we always use when talking about Eastern Market is, and this is such really, um, really opened my eyes when I first heard it years ago, that all different job levels, types, a lot of growth within a business, like in that Wolverine Packing example, or McClure's Pickles is kind of a, a good poster child, right? They grandma's pickle recipe, then they buy a 30,000 square foot building and turn it into the pickle factory, which I feel like there's a joke in there. But then you're in seven countries and 50 states. So they need someone who's the manager of the factory and somebody who is the global sales and marketing, right? And everything in between. And so, so many other jobs and, and industries that are trying to be grown, which is great growth all around. Let's bring it on. But the diversity of types of jobs um, and maybe interesting, to your point, unique jobs that are available to be grown in the food system. Uh, and, why, and because we're the last one left, it's kind of unique here as well. So we're a great opportunity for that. So it's a great point. Uh, Riska, what do you see in terms of the 
balancing that kind of older legacy and new investment and how you could try different things maybe to yeah. work it out. Well, reflecting back on the housing issue, we in the Netherlands, especially in Amsterdam, have regulations on that. We have the 40-40-20 rule. What a novel concept. Wow. You you have it here? No, our state outlaws us having any kind of uh, oh. regulation on that. So okay, just... okay. Well, actually, it works pretty well. <laughs> um, Good to know. Yeah, we we have, um, and, and there's a difference in the Netherlands between social housing and affordable housing. So Absolutely. affordable housing and social housing together makes up for 80%. So, um, and especially in Southeast, there is more social housing. The floors... Uh, above the shopping units is 100% social housing. Uh, and they, now they're adding more affordable housing and the free sector in there. So they're getting a mix. Um, but there's, there, it, it was on the investment, right? Um, I think it, it is all small changes adding up to a bigger one. For instance, in Southeast, all the development companies together with the big corporates and some educational institutions signed a social agreement saying that they would hire locally for the construction work, they would set up traineeships, they would do internships, there will be educational programs, uh, uh, they will even buy locally. So what we're doing, if we're having an event, it's a local caterer, it's all from the, from the neighborhood. And I think all these small actions eventually add up to bigger stuff. Is that mandated that or that they have to sign those partnerships? Yes, that is in a contract. Yes. Okay. So that is a we have our community benefits agreement here, but it only is triggered at I think we're at seven seventy five million dollars at um, projects at this point. But um, okay, so we're gonna actually gonna be going to questions in just a couple minutes. So get your thoughts, uh, you know, started thinking there. Um, what is something uh, with our last couple minutes? that um, is like a great example of intentionality. We've kind of talked about a little bit, but is there something where you're like, this is, so I can give an example while you think about it. Uh, so when we talk about intention intentionality and again, why it's important, A, making sure people understand why it's important. You know, why does it matter that we have to go, because in, being intentional takes more time it takes frequently then more money that goes with that time. Uh, it's certainly easier when we have a lot of things on our plates. It's really easy to let that last, you know, that that intentionality slide, right? Um, so making sure people understand the whys, the hows, uh, that we got to a place that we always start with. You can't just, hey, here's an empty building, isn't it? Now it's something else, isn't that great? What kind of policies and redlining and things that created the challenges? So I think that's really helped. We've really brought people to help them understand why it's necessary in the first place. So then they're going to be much more um, likely to engage in that intentionality. But um, with that Livernoy example, how do they maintain it at as a black business district without being exclusive at the same time? Do you, or you want to talk about that one or? Yeah, I, I'm sure, or, sure. I, I want to talk about being intentional in that space, especially in, a, in Detroit, which is a predominantly black city, right? Um, but without recognizing the generational barriers to creating historic wealth, then, then what are we doing, right? Well, how can you be in this work and involved in the city of Detroit and not acknowledge that? So for us in our work, we not only do we acknowledge that, but that does kind of help center some of the work that we look at moving forward. So we are working with Chase Cantrell's program. Um, we also are working with the uh, Capital Impact Program, the Equitable Development Initiative, and ensuring that the folks who are getting opportunity to be developers, to be small business entrepreneurs along these corridors are black residents of the city of Detroit, that that is a, pri a, a primary focus of our work. It's not the only, but we have to be intentional in saying that if we're going into these neighborhoods and creating a space where revitalization can happen, that revitalization is not going to be sustainable and resilient if you're not ensuring that those folks who live in the neighborhood or live close to these can, one, can live there, two, as, as, as KT indicated, indicated had the, have the income to stay in the neighborhood as it begins to progress. But then also this generational wealth question. If a lot of wealth has been capped and, and kept away from developers and communities in the city of Detroit, what can we do to be intentional about opening up those lanes to resources, to technical assistance? And so one of the things that we've done, we created a fund for 
for uh, four black developers, black and brown developers in the city of Detroit called the Ebiara Fund. This is a fund that supports and provides dollars on the equity investment side. So those folks who are starting their business as developers have the opportunity to get some of these funds and get access to them to help them, one, to hire additional folks, two, expand and grow their business. And then on the flip side of this, one of the things that we're doing in our programming moving forward as well is that a lot of folks want to go to the ribbon cutting. Um, the ribbon cutting is beautiful. I love going to ribbon cuttings. I love going to groundbreakings and all of that, but it makes no, it, it doesn't matter if you had a great groundbreaking, if you can't go back to that restaurant in two to three years later, right? Or that specific business. And so one of the things that we're, we're doing to support some of these entrepreneurs are being intentional about offering operation services. What are some of the things that if you make the best cheesecake in the world, you know, you make some some custom jeans or custom shoes that whatever your business is, how can we support you with how you operate that business on the back end? What are some of the, you know, the legal things that you might need? Do you have an accountant? Do you have someone who can help you with the process of inventory and how you manage that? So those are some of the things that we're being very intentional about of bringing to the table for these business owners and entrepreneurs so that when we look back at, you know, three to five years down the line after we've made these significant investments, that we can also look and see that those folks who were there, who made it through the storm, are there at the end benefiting from those investments that we've made. Thank you. Ladies, do you want to add? Do you want to add a little bit or do you want to kind of? We can open it up. Yeah, we can open it up. Awesome. Um, We have a gentleman with a mic over here. Do we have, uh, there's our first question. You can just tell us your name and uh, where you're from. Oh, uh, my name is Yusuf. I'm a new resident of Detroit. I'm from Ontario, Leamington, Ontario. Um, when I look around my peers, I see a lot of like passion, a lot of drive, and a lot of people are really excited about this, especially my generation. We're coming with a lot of fire. We sometimes get intimidated by how fast the train is moving. Could you give us some like tips or wisdom on how to hop on that train and ride the wave so we don't get left behind? The development... The development, a little train, bit of everything, the yeah. Mo- development, the everything, investment, about that. progress, basement, progress, all of it. The community, okay, in the city, yeah, or in wherever we're at. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll try my best to answer that question. We so we had a um, some of my students are in here, so maybe hey, whatever. But we had a, a conversation at lecture this week where we talked about we had a, a guest speaker who talked about how do you build a community led organization that you get involved in this type of work? And one of the things that he said that kind of just resonated with me is that a lot of young people think that you, you have to network vertically, right? Like you have to, Oh, I got to meet this person. This person's leading this shop. This person's doing that. And that's an important part of the process for sure. But that networking horizontally with your peers of folks who are like-minded, who have resources, who have that passion and saying like, how do we connect together and be able to build on our energy, on our ideas, on our passion, um, it makes a world of a difference because now you're talking to someone who understands your language. Because I'm, I'm, I'm just going to keep it real with you. I, I, I'm not on TikTok like that. Like I'm not on some of these social media platforms, but I understand the value of those and being able to communicate and be able to get your message across to what you're passionate about. And so my, my advice would be to Look at those peers as not just somebody that you're competing with or somebody that's going through the same process, but how do you create the foundation to build on the work you want to see happen around you and for the city that is, quite honestly, is going to be your future city, right? Yeah, I also, I I don't, I think there's a tremendous amount of value in participating in the smaller things too. Come to a Saturday market at Eastern Market and experience the market and, you know, come and plan to spend several hours there, patronize the businesses in the neighborhood. Um, it, I mean, at having been a young person many years ago myself, I could attest to things that can be intimidating, but I just encourage you to just try not to be intimidated because for one thing, in a place like Eastern Market and places like downtown or Midtown or uh, Livernoy or East Warren, these businesses want your patronage. So they're looking for shoppers. They want customers. So um, I think that just keep that in mind that build relationships with the business owners, build relationships with the vendors at Eastern Market. I mean, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a very welcoming, uh, that, that to me, I mean, I, th- I think there's a lot of structural ways to get involved. But I do think that one of the ways you kind of break down the barriers to feeling intimidated about something or feeling like you're not part of something is to is to choose to participate in it. And I, one of the things that's just so great about Detroit these days is there's so many opportunities to participate. And so just, just 
find them, talk, like what Jermaine said, talk to your peers. There's, um, and, and then I would say too, just a little bit of, um, you know, my organization, we're a nonprofit organization. Our mission is to get you engaged. So reach out to people like me. I, I want to talk to everyone about the Eastern market and the things happening in our neighborhood. And I don't want some, I don't want to be somebody who's intimidating. And so I want there, we, that's what we exist for. We're a mission driven organization. We're here to talk to people and to spread the word of the organization in the neighborhood. Yeah, same. Um, you know, our mission at City Institute is to provide a deeper understanding of Detroit so that locals and stakeholders are better equipped to shape an equitable and thriving city. And so by understanding and connection is a big part of that. Um, so we're always happy to help. I think that Detroit's greatest asset are its people. And that's actually going to be what we talk a little bit more about it. The next panel I'm moderating um, in, a, in a little bit. But um, other places, they might be like, oh my God, why are you talking to me? But in Detroit, we just talk to people. Like just, hey, what's your story? Go talk to the small business, the person behind the bar. Oh, you happen to be third generation owner? Wow, that's amazing. Um, and I know, but once you start it, it, like, it starts to just go. Also, there's all these nonprofits. For so long, Detroiters didn't have the resources of the city and, and others uh, really paying attention. So it's like, why don't we have this? I'll do it. And there are so many that would love to have young voices be a part part of their board, their committees, their events. Volunteering isn't just about planting trees, which is awesome. There's actually like using your brain and conversing and connecting that is um, a desperate need for a lot of organizations throughout the city. So um, that's another really great way. All right. Uh, one more question, I think. Sorry, back in the back here. We try to get you in if we have, have, have time. Hi, my name is Sylvia Green. I'm a member of several organizations, and I want to just make a comment to you, young lady. You just threw that word out, redlining. You guys just don't know until you get that straightened out, Detroit is not going to be what you want it to be. And what I'm finding is a lot of the younger people, they come to me, you know, white, black, whatever, just coming into the city. They say, Ms. Green, what happened? Why is my insurance three times more? Until you lobby everybody lobby to eliminate redlining, which destroyed our city. Uh, we're not, all these summits and things that we have, it's not going to help. Um, as a member of the Coalition of uh, Senior Detroit owner, Homeowners, I want to know what's in it for us. Most of our homes, like mine, is 106 years old. Many homes require lead abatement, roof, porch, all that. I know they got different programs, but they have an income level. Everybody in Detroit is not poor, but most Detroiters need some help, especially as seniors. So I wanted to know, what, how are you addressing that? Thank you so much. And you're totally right. I mean, I threw it in there because this is a very short conversation, unfortunately. Um, but it's also meant to spark larger conversations. We offer a redlining racism and segregation virtual presentation every month for free um, that anybody can join to understand the how did we get here, the policies that are still impacting and still existing today in many ways. Um, so having that is, a, you know, understanding is that big important part. Um, seniors, and the, this goes to the sustainability as well, right? Like older houses. And um, are there any programs that you guys have in the Netherlands for older folks? Um, and how do you do things with older houses? Because um, we're like, oh, our house is 110. You're like, my house is 310 years old, probably in Amsterdam. Um, and then also Jermaine or anybody, if you want to also talk about, uh, I know there's programs that Detroit has specifically for fixing roof, like large projects for older homes and, and that are mostly seniors. So programs on renovating houses. Yeah. I think there are some subsidies, but that is making your house more climate adaptive. Um, so not that I'm aware of. Most most social housing is is owned by housing corporations, and they're just you know taking care of um, any programs house. for out, like after a certain age programs for older people, or they're just generally taking care older of people. By, yeah. That's interesting. Well, there are a lot of old people in the Netherlands, and that's growing. Um, and we are lagging behind on uh, catering for their needs. We are well. Most project developers are more into building. Family houses, because that makes more money, but we need other kind of houses to cater for the senior people. Yeah. Jermaine or Katie? Did Katie do that? Sure. I'll, I'll just, just add just this, this one piece, which is 
I don't think we're doing enough as a country to to focus on this type of housing. So to have housing that's 106 years old, 115 years old, however old it is, is 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 something that we need to address and figure out how we can update those for that the climate experience that you know more than likely we we will, we will all experience moving forward. But the piece that 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 kind of drives me crazy, and I just you know because we're all friends and family in here, right? Uh, the thing that the thing that really drives me crazy in this space is that we don't think about seniors and and older folks that we as this generation are going to be there one day. Right. We're always trying to we're planning cities and thinking about these spaces in a context for how it serves us as opposed to how it serves all generations. And so I, I do think that there is a, a, a need um, to to focus more on what we're offering our seniors, because that's going to be one, us one day. Right. So when you're planning cities, you have to think about the youngest amongst us being intentional, and being intentional. Right. Of, of thinking about the youngest amongst us, but also about the older, the older folks and what we're offering. Accessory dwelling units uh, for those who want to live with their family and and be close and live on the premises, but might not want to live in a house with your kids because they your grandkids might drive you crazy, right? Like so, so you you have all of these experiences when it comes to housing that exist in other countries and exist in in other parts of the U.S. that haven't made their way to Detroit that offers up that ability for folks to age in place live in their house. And if you do decide you're in a 106 year old home, but you want to downsize and move into somewhere that is accessible for you or provides you some of the amenities that you need. I'm not, I saw you shake your head. I'm not telling you to move your house. I'm just saying that there are folks who want to transition in other spaces and do not have enough housing available to them. So, so if I can say anything, we definitely need to focus on that. And I hope that there is somebody out here in this crowd right now uh, who's, who's working on this issue and will bring it to the forefront for all of us to become passionate about. Yeah, and we'll look up some of those programs too because um, I know about them in a general sense that because you're right, for so long, if you couldn't get a home loan because of redlining, it was you really can't get a home equity loan to put a new roof on and all of those things. So that is being starting to be addressed. Um, and I can find out some more details about that for you. Um, we're going to have to wrap it up. And I know a couple folks have to go super fast. I'll be around for a few minutes. And and uh, and Jermaine, too, if anyone didn't get to answer their question, wants to talk to us offline. Um, but let's give a round of applause for our panelists today. And um, thank you so much for joining us.